so I, I thought I'd write, I'd been thinking so much about this um, concept of the model and talking a lot about it with Josh for over four years. I thought I'd try to write a little bit of something about this for this presentation. So um, I'm going to just start out with these, uh, with a couple of pictures of this piece, which is called Extended Landscape Model for Total Reflective Abstraction. It's about uh, 10 feet by 11 feet by 3 feet high. I've been interested in the concept of the model as a mode of sculptural and artistic thought since discovering a story about unfulfilled and thwarted vision involving Buckminster Fuller and Osama Noguchi. This story, which I'll relate in a moment, led me to a number of questions and ideas. How is the effect of a model made by an artist different than that of one made by an architect? An architect uses a model to convey information to garner financial, political, ideological, or institutional support. But the model created by an artist can exist outside these considerations. Can the inherent scale of a model and the fact that it depicts something that is not intended to be built be a specific kind of imaginary space? Can the rules that structure the model be bent to the purposes of abstraction or the construction of a labyrinth of ideas? If the hard and soft sciences use the concept of the model as a way of proposing new systems of understanding, can art do the same? This is an, just another view of the piece. Um, recently, I was asked to participate in a symposium on the idea of power in art, and I discussed my interest in models, specifically the idea of a model of an aesthetic utopia that can never be built. I'm fascinated by the notion that the artist's typical lack of ability to access political power and large capital to actualize their ideas on a wide scale might actually have distinct advantages. The architect or the scientist must grapple with the question of how their work will be built, enacted, adopted, co-opted, or perverted by the economic and power interests of others. The artist can perhaps have the opportunity to present utopian ideas without the same danger that others, that others might actually attempt to enact them. Of course, there are exceptions to this distinction that I'm proposing. Artists in the past couple of generations have regularly and brilliantly straddled these boundaries, from Robert Irwin to Andreas Zetel to cooperative groups like N55. This is a sculpture, a modernist landscape in scale, by Osama Noguchi, and it's called Playground for the United Nations Headquarters, New York, from 1952. I was never particularly drawn to Noguchi's work other than his furniture and his lamps. The only sculptural works that I found compelling were the ones that did not begin as sculpture but as models. And this is an example of one of them. In a story that's tinged with racism and conservative thinking, Noguchi was repeatedly thwarted by Robert Moses at least three times over a period of 30 years in his attempt to create modernist playgrounds for the city of New York. His response to this I found really interesting. He cast his plaster models proposal models into bronze and then recast them as sculpture, resulting in imaginary landscapes that one can imagine walking through. Instead of an authoritative vision in which Noguchi imposes monolithic form upon us, these work functions as proposals, inviting the viewer to envision a new world on a huge scale. Some people have termed this surrealist landscapes, but I see them just more as generally a modernist form. In an essay that Ingrid Schaffner wrote in connection to a performance project of mine, there was a footnote that led me to a suggestive story about Noguchi and Fuller. Upon his return from his apprenticeship with Brancusi in 1929, Noguchi fell into conversation with Buckminster Fuller about the possibility of the existence of form without shadow. They concluded that this situation could only exist with a totally reflective form situated in a totally reflective environment. Noguchi made a single experimental effort at testing this idea with a portrait bust of Fuller in chromed metal placed inside a studio painted everywhere in reflective silver. This is the, the bust. For me, the notion of a totally reflective environment was highly suggestive. It seemed to me that like a physical metaphor for the modernist psychological and sociological notions of self-examination, and more generally the tension between the self and the other. A reflective object, one without shadow, and a liquid fugitive surface could represent capitalism's false promise that all evidence of human labor can be erased. So I thought, where is the art world's school of total reflective abstraction from 1957 to 1964? So my project began as an attempt to materialize what such a thing might look like. I attempted to use Noguchi's vocabulary form and his gesture of a landscape model turned into a sculpture to see what a totally reflective world might look like. 
So this is taken from a low angle to try to give you a sense of that scale, of like walking through this, this totally reflective landscape. This group of sculptures tried to be a scaled version of a landscape of abstract modernist form. Both the field of the landscape and all these architecturally scaled shapes are completely reflective mirror. The forms appear to visually melt into the surface, doubling each shape into a new one. This effect is enhanced by the material nature of glass mirror. The reflective surface is behind or on the back of the glass, so where reflection and hard surface starts is hard to determine. Realized at full scale, this would result in a disorienting space at many levels. My hope is that the viewer could imagine walking through this kind of landscape. This is another version of this idea. This is called Architectural Model for Total Reflective Abstraction Playground, echoing uh, Noguchi's design for playgrounds. And here's a close-up. These photographs do not convey what the experience of looking at these sculptures is like. This is because they are never the same. They are always reflecting what is occurring in front of them. And of course this means, most importantly, that they reflect the viewer. Wherever you look, you are reflected hundreds of times. Conventional, mirrored reflections, but also distorted, abstract, and ever-changing reflections of yourself. If one would take me up on contemplating what this world would look like, realized at full scale, what interests me about the idea becomes apparent. A totally reflective world would reinforce many of our supposedly most central Western and corporate values. A world in which self-examination is paramount, where there is a constant dialogue between the self and the other, where we reflect and adapt to our ever-changing surroundings, i.e. the audience or the market. But it would be a world in which one could never hide, never simply be, without confronting one's own image, never forget that, that others are constantly observing, and be forever plagued by distorted visions of yourself. In other words, it would be a horror. Another piece, model for total reflective abstraction after a conversation between Buckminster Fuller and Osama Noguchi. And there you can really see how it kind of melts into the surface and becomes a double form. But only through really a video of it can you see a little bit of what it's like to be in front of that, but without seeing your own reflection, it's not the same. The gesture or concept of a world unified by a single seamless aesthetic, an aesthetic utopia, if you will, is something that is implied by many modernist visions, schemes, and structures, as well as, of course, by totalitarian governments. The perfection of a picture of this in one's mind's eye can be highly seductive, but it is, of course, illusory because no matter how much violent erasure is applied, individuals will alter or place their mark on their environment and corruption and rebellion will inevitably occur. This is true of all utopias, aesthetic or otherwise. It is absolutely clear that no true utopia can ever be realized except for fleeting moments. But does this mean that the idea of utopia should never be contemplated? This kind of gives a, a sense of how much you can sort of fall into this world of reflections when you're looking at it. This is a 12-foot by 8-foot by 4-foot piece. And that's where I, I've begun to think about the role of the artist in modeling or proposing utopias. Artists in Western society are often stereotyped in two seemingly contradictory ways. On one hand, they are written off as being impractical dreamers, impotent in their ability to change the structures of the world. On the other hand, they are lauded as special agents of unique creative abilities and as barometers or prophets of their era. I am particularly interested in the prospect of artists modeling their visions of utopia, an island utopia, in order to keep the idea alive. Utopia is a construct that seems to me to be hard to live without and still have hope. I would propose that it is one of the central ideas of aesthetics, along with description and critique. Even if its beauty and naivete are problematic, that is the point in some sense, to describe in as clear and as extreme a way as possible how a changed world might look. It seems that the format of the model, architectural or otherwise, is well suited for the discussion of utopia if it is made with the intent not to solve problems or convince others but to evoke questions conversation confusions fascination contemplation new philosophic inquiries imaginations fantasies and repulsions this piece is called an end to modernity so here I'm going to digress from the architectural model to a project of mine that uses the idea of a model to create instead a huge object this is uh, 16 feet by 12 feet round this piece is both a sculpture and a, quote, accurate scale model of the history of the universe from the Big Bang to now. I made this in collaboration with a cosmologist, and it does something that scientific models normally do not do. For conceptual reasons, it's generally impossible to make a model of the space of the universe, for instance, because the universe may be infinite. So this you can get a little bit of the idea of scale. But it turned out to be possible to make an object that within its own parameters accurately models the central concept of the Big Bang, the explosion of time, space, and history itself. 
The sculpture is titled An End to Modernity because my main intention was to create a material metaphor for what the Big Bang implies. The physical evidence for the theory was discovered in 1965, the same year as a famous group of chandeliers was designed for the Metropolitan Opera House here in New York. I've tried to unify these two events. The chandeliers were designed at the moment when modernism as an aesthetic and historical project was beginning to splinter apart. Big Bang Theory does one thing that is especially unusual in terms of historical thinking. It definitively ends the notion of our central place in the cosmos. It says there is no center to the universe. It further suggests that a valid history of the universe can be told from any point in time or space, that there's no one single progressive narrative. So even though any visual model of the Big Bang Theory is deeply insufficient conceptually as far as scientists are concerned, of course it is human nature to try and create one. So this is a drawing of the idea of the Big Bang by scientists from the 60s. And here is a still from my short film that I made about the chandeliers, an abstract film. The abstract drawing translates easily into the design of these objects, I think. And that's sort of how I, I was inspired to do the project, was this notion of these being sort of a diagram of this or a pop image of the Big Bang. And then this is another diagram of the history of the universe from the Big Bang to now that ended up echoing my sculpture very specifically. It's also from the 60s. An end to modernity, my model slash sculpture attempts to create a visual description of the splintering of modernism, the last gasp of the notion that there is an order and structure to history. These clusters that are at the end of all the rods accurately depict the spatial groupings of galaxies at particular moments in the history of the universe, but in an abstract way, they suggest the complexity that arises out of the demise of this singular narrative that we have subscribed to for a long time. So each one is completely unique and accurate according to the statistical sampling and observations of the state and history of the universe. So now I'll go back to the project that's upstairs, the Alpine Cathedral and the City Crown. The Alpine Cathedral is on the right and the City Crown is on the left and it's intended to be a kind of abstract city cosmopolitan grid based on the forms in the city tower and then a kind of geometric topographical map of a mountain elevation. All of it is supposed to be a kind of provisional architectural model. So I'm going to discuss it most, the piece mostly as it relates to this question of the model. Bruno Taut's crystal chain group was constructed as an essentially artistic enterprise. They did not intend for anything that they proposed to be built, nor did they intend to solve material structural problems or even provide a framework for a future kind of architecture. They simply tried to use their skills as architects and thinkers to describe an impossible world as a philosophic exercise. Walter Gropius was a dissenting member of the group because he wanted to have a practical impact. But it was the crystal chain's language and imagery that was in Gropius's founding speech and printed material for the opening of the first Bauhaus school. So in that sense, the effort had a lot of impact. These plans, never intended to be realized, resulted in new theories and cultural practices. Tout and Schirbart were interested in glass architecture as a concept for creating a new world. Their vision was not what eventually was built. One can draw a pretty straight line from Joseph Paxton's Crystal Palace of 1851 to Mies van der Rohe's model of a totally transparent glass tower in 1921, which Tout was the first to publish in his magazine called The Dawn Light, to Trump Tower and urban capitalist architecture worldwide. Tout and Schirbart proposed instead a rough-hewn, crystalline, not completely transparent, and ever-changing architecture. This kind of gives you an idea of it's a temporal piece that changes over three minutes and 20 seconds, 10 different colors, in a syncopated rhythm that's quite slow between the two models. So this is just a sort of example of that. The translucency, not transparency, reflects its politics or their idea of politics and spirituality. Their idea of a, a modern world out of glass was something perhaps you could say is a a hybrid between a Chartres Cathedral and Las Vegas of the 1960s. And this gives you an idea of the depth of the light inside the uh, models. Three things made their vision unlikely to be enacted by modern capitalism. One, the idea of co changing colored lights inside and outside their buildings did not suit the idea of an authoritative and unified message of the corporation. Two, the kind of translucent mottled surface, crystalline shaped glass that they wanted to use as elements of their glass world did not lend themselves to the mode of ever increasing manufacturing and construction efficiency, as could be exemplified by the skin of this building. The idea of a perhaps more humanist, obfuscating and soft lit glass architecture did not fit seamlessly into the developing goals 
of global capitalism. It did not create the illusion of, quote, transparency so central to the myths of capital flow and embodied perfectly by what became the international style in architecture. My sculptural installation is not intended to suggest that Tout and Schierbart's vision would have been any better than the perverted realization of Van der Rohe's and others' ideas that infest the globe worldwide today. It simply hopes to draw out an alternative and to invite contemplation of how ideas of remaking the world remain so central and captivating, but are so easily warped and misused. Thank you.